Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. If you've been blessed by our podcast, please prayerfully consider partnering with us on Patreon. Your support will help cover the cost to produce the podcast, but will also give you access to exclusive content like monthly reflections and special live stream teachings. Go to patreon.com slash restore the glory and join the mission of experiencing the restoration of our God-given glory. Hey, Bob, good to see you again. I think I say that every single time. I think I've probably said that like 70 times now. I say the exact same phrase to start off every single episode. So, hey, Bob, <laughs> how are you today? I'll say a little bit different. Yeah, I, I, I think it's because we don't see each other much in between. So it's kind of, it is good to see you again. It is good to see you. Yeah, we are still in our series on same-sex attraction, and I'm delighted to introduce our guest today. I've been knowing Hildy, Hildy Prunt, for maybe, I don't know, I've lost track five, six years Mm. Hildy, I, I don't know when we started, but uh, I've come to to know and love her as she's moved down to Tallahassee in the last few years oh, wow. and gotten to know her well. And I let her tell her story. But the thing that I was just telling you, Jake, off camera was that the thing I just so admire about Hildy is she just is passionate for the truth. And mm. any place of her life that doesn't conform with the truth, she is just relentless in wow. prayer in allowing God to move her heart in conformity with the truth. And I think everybody will hear right. that in this story because she also has a pretty strong temperament, pretty strong will. That's awesome. So her will does not move easily. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and and let me just be clear, I have not been working as a therapist with Hildy. I've just been just kind of walking over time in a kind of an accompanying friendship relationship. And again, all that will become clear as, as, as she shares awesome. her story. So Hilda, you want to just start with introducing yourself and how we came to know each other, and then we'll go from there. Okay. How I met Bob, it's actually part of a bigger context, but it was pretty mm -hmm. cool. But there are like two parts of my conversion that I got real desperate and uh, mm. really prayed, really prayed. And one was when I had my initial conversion, but mm. the second one, and again, there's a bigger part of all this, but I was really struggling for a long time in my heart. Like there were things going on in my heart and I knew nothing about healing, nothing about healing ministry. Mm. So I was like struggling. And I just knelt down and prayed one day, God, I, I don't know what's going on in my heart. Like Send me something, send me, send me something, send me someone who can help me uh, understand this or put words to this or something. Mm -hmm. And that was just a simple prayer. And then a couple of days, I was living in Steubenville at the time. Oh, cool. I went into the chapel there, which is my routine. And there was a book. It was, somebody had left the book. One of those was during the priest conference and it was Be Healed. And so never heard of Bob, never oh. understood any of this. But, the, you know, there's a backstory to that too, because growing up, there's just, kind of a cynicism towards healing and healing ministry. And mm. I, I know I remember switching through channels and there'd be a be healed, you know, there, there, there'd be these televangelists be healed, you know, and I'd always joke around like, this is so silly. Like, this is like, so when I saw that book, I was very drawn to it, but I put it down and I'm like, this cannot be possible. So I prayed my rosary, which is what I do. And there was a deeper draw after that. And I just said to God, you know, I've been struggling a long time. Hmm. If I meant to read this book, because obviously someone left it there. I opened it up and there was a priest that said, God bless you. He just left it there for whoever would come. And I happened to be that person. Hmm. And so I prayed to God and I said, if this is meant to be, and this is going to help me because I had struggled a long time with this. So I just opened it randomly and it was chapter six, I believe. And it was about wounds. And it just spoke directly. I mean, I was like, I read that book in a couple of days, like literally twice almost. And then there's a deep inspiration to, you know, call, call the author, which is Bob. And I was a little nervous about it, but it was so strong. Mm -hmm. And that will he was talking about, you know, it can be used <laughs> two different ways, right? I just remember feeling so strongly I needed to contact this person because I kind of met him through this book. It, it's like... Mm -hmm. There's such a deep love and sincerity and like all that stuff that I thought about, you know, the healing ministry and I didn't understand or know, it just kind of went out the window because this authenticity of this author, you know, 
So I called the number. I looked up John Paul II Healing Center. I called this number, didn't know what I was doing, which I've done this a number of times in my life. And God blesses that or he closes the door, you know, but I felt so strongly. And there's a female voice on the other phone. And I ended up leaving a message. And there's more to it than that. But finally, I get this phone call back. And there's a female voice. I had no idea who it was. Mm. And so I expressed my excitement about what happened. And I just need to talk to, you know, this author. And, and she's like, that's not possible. He doesn't do this work anymore. And it's, so mm. at the end of the day, I just said to God, you know, this is from you. I said this little prayer in my heart. And I said, this is from you. You got to do something. So mm. I just said, okay, this is what this book did for me. I read this book and this is what the words touch my heart so deeply and I just know I'm supposed to talk so there's something that happened in that 30 second period of time where I said that and the person on the other phone said you know she said wow those words you just used is exactly what my dad said when he prayed over this book and he read this book so wow. I she said but I still can't let you <laughs> I, I, so, so I said look this just ask him to pray about it okay so she said she would and then within a couple of hours, Bob called and I, I thought it was, she said, well, I'll call you back. And uh, it was Bob calling and wow. I was up taking a walk and it started raining. And I remember he called and I had to take shelter under this little, you know, housing project. And it was so weird because that St. Paul quote about your new creation, the old has passed away and the new. So I had to take shelter under this roof of this housing up on campus. Mm -hmm. And that's how I met him. And it, it's so beautiful. That's crazy. And then uh, said, I'll pray. And, and and then the Holy Spirit just led to this, him walking oh. this journey. And Bob, what was that like for you? What was it like on your side? Because I, I mean, you, you probably get a lot of invitations to talk. Yeah, at, at first, it was uh, a resistance in me. Any, you know, just in that place of, I've got to have clear boundaries, and I'm not a therapist anymore. And I can't do that. And occasionally, you know, I'll have conversations with people and, and God always works in that. But it's, it was like this wrestling, you know, this wrestling of, okay, God, I'm, I'm feeling like Kristen was so, it was my daughter, Kristen, who at the time oh. was our person who was the office she's manager. No pushover, and, so that's like, not... <laughs> no, she's not a pushover. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so she, she's a good uh, guardian, yeah. if you will, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> of, of my boundaries. Cause she knows my whole life, how in years too, Jake, you know, this is just the merciful heart is always, wanting to help everybody and you know just how do you keep boundaries in that and it becomes an area of weakness so you know it was like she was wanting to protect my time and energy to do the things that god's calling me to do in this season and yet she really had a conviction and so she said that and i trusted her conviction and then when i talked to hildy i heard her conviction i trusted her mm -hmm. conviction and so it's just been a joy getting to know hildy but it was a challenge in the beginning and again, we can both look back and say, well, the enemy was even trying to block that from the very beginning because of what God has been doing uh, through our friendship. Hildy, can I ask an awkward but vulnerable question? And you're allowed to say no. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> you're on a, a series about same-sex attraction and people who experience that. Can you draw us into that part of your story? And what was that something that you brought up with Bob? Like, this is the first time you and I are meeting. So this it's kind of fun, because I'm just like the audience, I'm hearing every and I'm trying to, what would they want to know? So like, help us understand, like, what happened in your story that Bob would think this is a great person to have on the podcast for this series? Tell it, walk us through your story. The reason I'm asking is because one of the premises that is out there in the world with regard to people with same sex attraction is understanding their human development, their psychosocial, it's called their psychosocial development, right. how they developed with people and how they developed psychologically. And so I'd love to hear just that part of your story because I'm imagining you guys got into stuff that had to do with same-sex attraction and all that kind of stuff yeah well the initial conversation didn't quite go that way but oh. um it it was you know it took a long time i i would there was a lot of trust issues for me hmm. with, with people and just my life and the woundedness you know mm -hmm. so i think it took probably a year because bob and i wouldn't talk regularly i think i think initially the first year is maybe every six weeks every couple months or something 
And um, he was praying and I was praying. And at first I thought, you know, in the first year, like maybe I was wrong, you know, maybe, mm. but it was so profound. So when I reached out to him, but God was just let me build trust with him. Wow. And when that time came where I could actually walk through stuff with him, it, it took a little while. And I think as that trust built, that's when God started to act. Wow. So not that he wasn't acting in the building of the trust, but I mean, I think I've been challenged that trust. He could probably tell you that in different ways because it's mm. all, I didn't, you know, subconsciously just maybe testing that trust, you know, yeah. and, and the Lord would show me that later. Like, you know, he, he was just always so patient and treated me the same all the time and um, just accepted me where I was at at the time. But how this all started, I can say is that, you know, try to succinctly go through how this all happened because there's a lot of time there before I reached out to him. You know, I, I grew up in a very strong Orthodox Catholic family. Okay. My mom actually at one point before she married wanted to be a nun. It didn't work out. So our house was a little convent at times, you know, we had, everything was structured. <laughs> it really was. I mean, she told us, we, we, she had my dad get a house across the street from a Catholic church in school. So we walked, she wanted us to be close and oh, wow. it was a really beautiful thing because, uh, you know, the church was in the center of our community and all our friends really lived around that. Wow. The, the playground, it was a large play, playground school, large church. That's how we lived our life. You know, we went to school and she'd say when the Angelus bells ring at six, that's dinner. We pray the rosary every night. Wow. And as I grew up, you know, and my mom, uh, it was eight of us in a short period of time. <laughs> and so uh, mm. God bless her. She did the best she could and just like handling all of us kids. But I know when I was young, there are just a lot of things that I heard and internalized. I was the last of eight and everybody's kind of, you know, uh, there's a real troubled pregnancy at the end. And so uh, there's emergency C-section my mom had to have when every, everybody else was, you know, there's a question of my life or my mom's life. And I know my mom tells a story. She told this story. She told the doctor, you know, he's like, you have seven kids, you know, this baby. I know you don't want to lose this baby, but it was that serious, I guess, at one point wow. is what I was told. But, you know, she told us, she told the doctor, no, this baby's going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. And I'm going to trust her to the blessed mother. So we were both fine. But growing up, it was like a lot of teasing, a lot of things. And I really internalized that, you know, it's things like no. you almost killed mom. And, and I know oh. they were teasing my brother's sisters. It's usually my brothers, but they would say stuff like that. Like, because of you, mom almost died. Uh, there were eight kids. And so my brothers would say, you know, you kind of ruined the family. You were supposed to be a boy because, you know, it would even the family. And they were joking. I could see now that when I was a kid, I just kind of internalized right. that. I guess I just kind of lived out that role. I mean, it's not something when you're a little kid, I really thought about it. So now, now I can look back. Um, so as I grew up, I hung out with one of my brothers the most. So I really was excelled in sports. I mean, it was just natural to me. I liked it. Uh, none of my other sisters. And I, I'd grow and see them talk about boys and date boys and get into high school and all that. But it was not something I was attracted to. You know, I just really attracted when I hung out with the guys or the boys at school, play sports with them. And they'd be like my friends, you know, hmm. and I had girlfriends too. But I'd notice as I got older, there'd be girls I was attracted to, you know, just in a mm -hmm. way I didn't understand, not as a girlfriend, but just something deeper. And it was more mm -hmm. emotional and not really sexualized or anything at that point. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, a huge factor is this with my mom. There were some issues in our family. It's not her fault. My oldest sister was very sick my first couple of years of life. My grandmother ended up watching me, my, old, uh, my older siblings, which they didn't do the greatest job. They were teasing <laughs> me a lot. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's okay. It's not okay. But at the time, this is the environment I knew. And I yeah. didn't really know this until I was older, that my mom just couldn't be available to me. At the end of the day, I just think a combination of all these things. And I remember just growing up craving that love from her. I mean, I would really try to get that love from her and she just couldn't do it. You know, and how she, you know, related God to us, it wasn't really personal to me. It was more like, this is what we do. You know, we pray the rosary and I'd be like, why? Or you know, we'd go to church, obviously faithfully as a family, Jesus is on the altar where, like it was never really explained. It was a lot of rules and regulations and things. And so I was always a willful little kid. My, my older brother's sisters will say that. It just got to the point where I got to high school and 
her and I just start clashing. Hmm. And that's what kind of, you know, it, it kind of my sports was like my outlet. I love basketball. So we had a really good high school basketball team and I spent hours just, you know, with my friends and, and, and there were situations on our high school basketball team, but it w- wasn't something I connected to at the time. I, I wasn't really like I was attracted to it, but there was a girl that was pretty openly, you know, living lesbian lifestyle and, and would be holding hands with her girlfriend in high school, you know, things like that. You know, I thought it was like, wow, you know, like, I, I don't know. I connected it somehow to how I felt emotionally about some of my friends, but it wasn't again, sexualized. And then I got to college. That's when I got my first job. And there was a, I played on the basketball team at the hospital. I worked, I'm a nurse. So I was going through nursing school and that was my first job was at this Catholic hospital. And so every year they do this big tournament in New York and you could join one of the sports teams and they raise money for the hospital and everything. And she was a therapist at the a physical therapist at the hospital. And I would notice she'd be on this team and she was a horrible basketball player, but she would keep coming up. I mean, horrible, but she'd come up to me all the time and just compliment me. And I thought it was kind of weird, but I, I didn't know this at all. My mother and my dad, they were so like innocent. They didn't, they just never talked to us about sex or never talked to us about relationships or what to expect or anything. So I just thought she was being nice, you know, and complimenting me, you know, probably my pride. I'm just a great basketball player or something, which I wasn't. I was okay. It just got a little friendly, you know, she would, and she didn't tell me this, but she invited me to, to play tennis with her and at the university. And she was like eight years older than me. And I thought, yeah, I can whip this girl, you know, I'm a good athlete. Mm. And turned mm. out she was a tennis player at the college there and oh, man. just totally wiped me off the court. And it kind of opened up this thing. So she asked me to go to US Open. And so I was still living at home and my mom and I mm. were just really, really clashing at the time, really clashing. And I would share this with her. So I go home and my mom said, I don't want you to go. And I was in college. I was still living, I was like 19. Mm-hmm. And just because she said that, I said, well, I'm going, you know, it's like, yeah. you can't tell me what to do. I'm like, well, you're living under my roof, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I don't have to live under your roof. So at the end of the day, I went with her really not feeling in my heart was the right thing to do. She ended up telling me on that trip, what's the worst thing you ever done? That's how she introduced. I said, probably nothing. I haven't done any, you know, and she said, well, I've been slept with a woman before, you know, and I'm like, big deal. You know, it didn't mean a lot to me. Mm-hmm. And But when I got home, there's just a lot that happened with her in between and my mom. So I kind of turned to her and and she really, really spent a lot of time getting me emotionally drawn to her. You know, I mean, I'm saying this not at the time. I'm saying this looking back and walking through this with Bob. I can see that it was a real grooming period, you know, that I had no clue. Mm -hmm. And my mom even said, you know, what does somebody her age want? Why is she spending all this time with you? Like, I'm concerned about you. My mom said that. And I just because my relationship with her, I'm like, I just did the opposite. Mm. One day she took me to her place and just, I want to show you my place. And she just asked me if she could kiss me, you know, and I was very emotionally at this point attached Mm -hmm. to her or drawn to her. I mean, I I really depended on her in a lot of ways because she filled in a space that my mom could not do. I felt loved by her actually. And it was innocent, you know, I mean. For, on my part, it wasn't innocent what I did, but but she didn't just kiss me. I mean, she went full blown into all this stuff that I had no clue and, and really shocking stuff. Hmm. I, I felt like I couldn't say anything because I thought if this is what this is all about, you know, like I had no clue. I thought just this is what two women do. So hmm. until I walked through this with Bob and there's a lot of shame there, it, it was actually walking through it with Bob was real sexual abuse thing you know going on there um that i didn't even realize i just thought that's what people did so from there i mean there's a lot more to it but from there after she got what she wanted which was really to my innocence was gone and i knew when i came home that night something was really wrong about what happened and Mm -hmm. i actually was still living at my parents home and then i had to leave i mean i knew i couldn't stay in their home and I ended up moving on campus, you know, but in the meantime, I had changed. I knew something changed in me and I didn't know what it was. And I had a faith in God. I mean, I, I you know, I started asking myself, am I a lesbian? Am I, is this like, because it didn't feel right what she did. Mm-hmm. 
but at the at the same time I couldn't talk to anybody about it at the time and that's just so uh, my older sister all my sisters started to get married and my next sister up Rita she was engaged to a guy and they just introduced me to a friend his roommate and I started hanging out with him just like a buddy and 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 Mm -hmm. I started getting all this attention from my family right I started feeling like I was fitting in which I didn't before and my mom was really happy and he was Catholic, you know, and she wanted me to marry a Catholic guy. So I started like dating him and was three months away from a marriage, you know, mm. that kind of ended because I met this other woman where I was working. Mm. And so I go to the priest. I'm so confused at this point. And I go to the mm. priest that was going to marry us. And I think it's really huge, you know, like what happened because this priest actually guided me in a direction that... I received it as approving of what I was doing Hmm. that kind of projected me into this lifestyle because I went to him and said, I couldn't marry. I was so nervous. I remember saying, he's just, my family's going to be so angry, but I met this other woman at work and I just felt so drawn to her. I felt like I, we got really, really close and she was married actually and had a child and uh, didn't plan it. Didn't, we just became really good friends. And she said, Hildy, don't live on campus. Just live at our house. You know, you don't have to pay any rent. You could just finish school. And so I did. And her and I worked every weekend together at at, at the hospital because I went to school during the week and she watched her child and obviously had to raise her child. So she worked weekends. But at the end of the day, it was just the most difficult thing for me because I had to tell Greg I couldn't marry him. And again, all this truth, you know, I always said, you know, I tell the truth. I'm okay. So I would tell people the truth, but I didn't really know what that truth was. It was just you know, so I told Greg everything, you know, he was very upset with me, obviously. Mm. When I talked to the priest, it was just really jarring because I told him everything. I thought, you know, I got to tell you the mm-hmm. truth. Like, this is who I think I am. I am I think I fell in love with this married woman and I was supposed to get married this guy. And I, I don't know who I am. And I, I, I don't mm. understand where to go from here. And basically he just told me a story and that story ended up really projected me into lifestyle more. And it was more like a conscience thing. He told me a story and said, basically follow your conscience. And my conscience wasn't formed. You know, my conscience was like Mm. what I felt. Mm. So I was so happy. You know, there's some weird freedom that came with that when he said that. And he knew that I told him everything, that this was a married woman. He didn't even say that. You know, I said, wow. And I remember saying that to him. If I stood before God, I could tell him, this is my conscience. This is what, you know, I'll be okay. Wow. Like, this is who I am. So from there, I entered into a relationship shortly or for a while with this married woman. And then the last four years, I mean, there's a long period of time here, but after that relationship did not work out, thank God, I entered into full blown into this lifestyle. It was about four years because everything was innocent to me. I was just looking for someone to love, someone to love me. I was looking for that love, which I didn't know at the time my mom didn't give me. You know, when I went into those last four years, it just became more and more of a hunger for that love. And then things became promiscuous. I started drinking, started doing things that I would never have done. And it, it became very addictive, my behavior, my lifestyle. But it got to a point in the last relationship I was in, it just kind of came full circle for me because the relationship I was in, this woman really pursued me and she was very innocent, so to speak. She'd not been in this lifestyle and I could just see me in her. And I don't know, it's God, but I didn't think about it at the time. It's just feeling this, this horror inside of me that, mm. yeah, I told her the truth. Like I was in this relationship. I told her, I don't really love you, but I can learn to love you. And she just met a lot of my needs and mm. it was horrible. And it's still to this day, it's horrible. So that's when I got on my knees and said to God, I think it was my birthday that year. I turned 30 that year and my 20s were just like a blur. I just said to God, you know, and I knew the teachings of the church, but you know, when that priest told me that, I've got to be honest, it it really gave me some free license to do what I was going to do. But I remember just praying to God, like, like I grew up and I know you're real, but you have to, like, I asked him two things. I didn't ask him to be straight. You know, I just said, Mm -hmm can you please just tell me the truth? Like, I love truth. This is the truth I know, but show me the truth. Just show me who I am. Just show me where to go from here. You know, Mm. it was really powerful. I can describe it now, but at the time I didn't know, you know, my faith really. And I'd lost all sense of that radar, the spiritual Mm. upbringing that I had. 
because my conscience, everything was really darkened at that point. But I remember saying, if you're, if you're real, you, you've got to show me and you've got to show me the truth. So two things I asked him, you got to show me you're real and, and the truth. They're just words came to my heart and I, it was go to Medjugorje, go to Medjugorje, which is weird because my mom had been telling us this in high school. Oh, did you hear? She had a deep devotion to Our Lady mm. and uh, she would tell us about what was going on in Medjugorje about Our Lady appearing to these children. And of course I blew it off at the time. Like that's a nice story. Mm. Being that will determined as I am, uh, there was a civil war going on at the time, and I had really, you know, I was going to get there, come hell or high water, I knew. Mm. So I did all this stuff on my own. You know, like, I didn't even think about Catholic tour groups or anything. <laughs> I was going through these secular tour groups, so I had it arranged to hop on this cargo plane, right? And, you know, it's delivering food supplies over there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, the lady said, well, you know, you're going into dangerous territory and we can't, we don't have a hotel. I said, that's fine. I'll find, I, I've always taken care of myself. I'll find something when I get there. And it was just this determination, this power, this empowerment to go. Yeah. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, our lady intervened, God intervened, heaven intervened. And I was at my parents' home one night and rare, hardly ever went there, but I went and on the news that night, these people had just got back from Medjugorje. It was on the news. And I'm looking at this like, I'm crazy. Like I'm going on a cargo plane. These people just got back. Right. And then the rest is history. I mean, I called the local Catholic tour group and they, they were perfect week uh, in September. I went just experienced both answers to that prayer. Powerful, powerful, powerful um, experience in Medjugorje. And when I got home in 10 days, so it was like, God showed me is real. So there, I think I prayed the rosary for the first time in a long time. And literally my, my be the, the little strings, the silver part of the rosary turned gold mm. the, at the end of the rosary, not kidding you. And I didn't go there for that. People would say, Oh, all these miracles are happening. I didn't go there for that. I just went to find the truth and know God was real. And he just showed me. And then when I got home, like all these scales just fell from, my, I just knew, I just knew the way that I was living. I didn't know where to go from there, you know, but I knew he told me the truth in my heart of who I was, you know, and mm. I was his daughter. And of course, you have to grow into that, but it was just a mm. powerful, powerful sense of walking away from that, the lifestyle I was mm. living and knowing that that was not who I was. That's my initial conversion. Hildy, there, I literally took my phone out and started taking notes because of things <laughs> that you're saying that were. I'll just list them on a very high level and maybe they will make sense or maybe they won't. But uh, so here's one thing you're raised in a Catholic environment and Catholic home and the desires, the relational dynamics remained, even though you're in, you know, a wonderful setting from the outside, right? It just because you're going to church every Sunday doesn't mean everything's perfect at home. I don't mean that to slight you. That's just the reality across the board. And so your story just on that level is articulating how you can have the most devout family in the world and still experience woundedness. Like you're not immune just because you go to church on Sunday. That might sound overly simplified, but I think a lot of people have a, a notion that's like, oh, well, I, I go to church. I'm fine. That relational dynamic still come up. So to press a little bit deeper I hate that I'm about to say what I'm going to say, but your direction of your life was significantly influenced by a priest going in, in, in a direction that wasn't ideal. And you said something that I think is just fascinating that I'm like, oh my gosh, that could be that we could really break that down, which is you equated conscience to emotion. So what I feel is what is right. And that was subtly linked for you in a way that it made sense. And then you said, I felt a ton of freedom. I felt a ton of relief. And what's so interesting is that at the same time, you're feeling all this freedom and relief, this truth thing in you is not at peace, but this freedom emotion is, and yet you're still at war within yourself. Like you're not integrated within yourself. Like I'm not at peace. I'm not settled. And it's like, and when you're saying all of that stuff, you keep describing, I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am. Hildy, I, I've worked with a lot of people and you're describing very core dynamics to the heart or to the soul that are universal emotion, identity, deep calling, like a unique calling 
for truth and that, you know, a primary way that you encounter God via truth and then all the relationships, the power of relationships that, so listeners, I hope that, you know, as you're hearing Hildy's story, maybe, you know, taking it at face value, it's powerful. There's a lot of really powerful layers here that are universal, I think. So Hildy, sorry if I'm, if that doesn't make much sense, but I'm like, oh my gosh, you're saying things that I think are very powerful across the board. Sorry, here's another one. The church for you was a primary way of knowing love and amen. Thanks be to God. And so when a priest says something, you inherently trust him because your whole upbringing is in this mode where this is the safe space, like your parents and everything. This is the place where everything's okay. So if a priest says something, it must be good. And I, I, I'm permitted to walk down the road. The layer of the, your mom and that tension simultaneously occurring, the ache there, the desire there, everybody has a longing for their primary relationships to be at peace, primarily mother and father, and then siblings. And then you're encountering a person who's quote unquote, loving you, but later learning, manipulating you and how that desire would be met. Like it just, I'm just like the timing is, I want to say awful because like, that's how you're hungry for something that's good. And somebody comes along and exploits it probably for their own broken heart. You know, I don't know if any of that made sense, but I'm like, holy smokes, there's just like, <laughs> layer upon layer upon layer of things that are just rich that apply to so many people. So I'll just pause there, Bob, what's striking you? And then we can, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can go in a couple of different directions here too, but I, I want to highlight things that you're saying in retrospect, you discovered, let me just name the things that you identified that I think have been critical for you in this process. One is the birth trauma. Mm. You know, it's, it's something as I know you're walking is something you're just continuing to walk in those deeper places of your heart. So it's like God has worked backwards in your healing to get down to the core places. And this is a pretty core place. So just name it. I don't want to say anything about, about it yet, but just name it. And then the place where your mom just really wasn't available to you. And the, the hunger for mother love, for feminine love, and then the teasing from your older siblings and them trying to be a replacement for your mom, but it never really satisfied what you needed. And the teasing of you almost killed your mom yeah, that's and awesome. what that did to you, you know, that just that, that kind of that who I am is deadly, who I am is a problem, who I, you know, my life is destructive kind mm -hmm. of, but also, you know, we wanted a boy, your brother's saying mm -hmm. we wanted a boy, you're, you're one of us and how much that then confuses identity, and then being good at sports, hmm. and being in that culture with sports, just how many of those factors, you know, and then your own discovery of, you know, I like to play with the boys, and I mm -hmm. kind of emotionally drawn to the girls, how many of those factors then played into your awareness of this identity of who am I, you know, just where is my attraction? Am I like everybody else? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. And, and you're saying most of that's coming in retrospect. You were just kind of living life through that. But most of that's coming in retrospect. The thing I want to focus on, uh, and we can come back to your conversion in just a second. But, you know, when you talk about the priest, you know, say, follow your conscience. I know how passionate you are right now. Do you want to say a little bit about how you feel when the cardinals in Germany and the priests who are well known in the church who are kind of saying that same message and what happens in your heart now as you hear them speak. <laughs> yeah, I would say there's a pain in my heart. You know, Jesus talks about in scripture, truth is related to freedom. So mm. I, I had to discover that obviously that was grace and through his mother. And so there's a pain in my heart because I desire, because I desire others to know this freedom. And because of what happened in my own life, this is the thing that comes to me when I kind of identified from the lens of a gay Catholic, like this is kind of a big thing right now. And I, I just applaud and just grateful for those who are living chastely. But I think there's a sense of that identity. I'm a gay Catholic instead of I'm a Catholic. You know, there's a sense that's still your identity. And so when I kind of identified that way, you know, I always saw that lens instead of the discovery I'm God's daughter. And, and I just 
desire that for other people. I, I really, really do, because there's such a beauty and a freedom in that. And so that's what happens to my heart. If it, it, there's just a pain there and it's a burning truth there, you know, I, but to share this with others, to know that that particular incident with that priest, um, and maybe it's his formation or maybe that's how he was formed in moral theology. But literally, he didn't say anything other than tell me a story. He told me a story that basically is based on conscience. And that story, I'm the one that responded to that story and say, wow, he never answered. It. He just kind of shook his head and that was it. Mm. And so, yeah. yes, it's very difficult when I hear this, Bob. So we, we have a lot of priests who listen to our podcast, mm. maybe even some bishops and cardinals. So what would you say to them, the ones who kind of are out of compassion, wanting wanting to kind of foster that kind of culture in the church, what would you say? I would say, please, no matter how difficult it is, please share the truth with them. Speak the truth and love to them. Because I'll just speak for myself, but I'm sure a lot of my friends, I had a lot of friends. And I think that a lot of people, it, whatever stage they are in their formation, you know, their conscience is not truly formed. It's not, you know, John mm -hmm. Paul talks about our conscience is being formed it's not like a you know to an objective reality outside of ourselves and a lot of people don't know that so they're equating that conscience with their inclinations or how they feel and so i would ask them to just please tell them the truth and let god let the holy spirit work in that and i know it's difficult to do because i know for me when i identified as a gay catholic it would be very offensive to me you know but I just wonder what would have happened to me. That's what I would have, would say to them. I wonder what would have happened or the direction maybe. I don't know if he would have sat down and explained to me, just explained to me the church's teaching in a deeper way and in a loving, truthful way. And not only that, but the person I was drawn to was actually married and he never said anything about that either. And I thought it was perfectly okay, you know, to do what I was doing. So that's what I would say. And then how about to the person? Because... You love truth. And so, you know, you had to face the truth about this is where your desire was, right? That that was being truthful, yes. right? And you didn't yet know the, the fullness of the truth of the church's teaching. So you were following the truth, quote unquote, of your heart. That I knew, my truth. Yeah. So what would you say to a person who says, this is my truth, this is who I am, this is my identity. Don't tell me what my identity is. My identity is I'm gay. I've always felt this way. How would you reconcile that subjective truth with the objective truth that you're talking about? How do you reconcile those two things? Well, I would say this because I've had a lot of friends even say that. That's your truth, Hildy. Because when I shared what happened to me, I pretty much lost all my friends. So mm -hmm. they would tell me that. That's your truth, Hildy. You found religion. That's great. That's not my path. And maybe you weren't even gay. That's what maybe you weren't even lesbian. That's what they say. And so I would try to express to them speak the truth, uh, like what God has done in my life, but actually try to express to them this objective reality, because truth is a person, you know, it's not a dogma, it's not a theological piece of paper or something, or something you study, it's truth is a person, and I know for me, I say, I want to follow that truth, I want to follow that person, because that's where freedom is, that's probably the best way I know how to describe that, mm -hmm. But I, I, I know I would want them to see all those things are important, how we feel, you know, it's not to dismiss anything about, I wouldn't want to dismiss that part of my life. But now that it's connected to a truth outside of myself, and not the truth that I, my identity is not what I feel, it's not my inclinations, it's not my attractions. You know, my identity is based in this reality, I'm a daughter of God. And that's something I have to grow into, it's not just to happen automatically. Mm -hmm. Hildy, do you just on a practical level, like, are you married right now? Or do you are you do you are you single or what? Yes. Um, so that was not my calling to be married. And um, hmm. there's a lot of woundedness there. But God has healed that attraction within me. If I do have an attraction, or it's just like a trigger or something, you know, okay, t you know, it's a process, but it just taking that attraction from me. And so he put a lot of people in my life, you know, priests and people in my life, a lot of men who's really healed. Those mm -hmm. relationships have really healed that part of my relationships with them. And then Bob, it really healed that part that uh, was so wounded with men. And in a sense, I can't even tell you why. I mean, I just never <laughs> related to men 
back of the day, you know, it's really other than working, going to work, and mm -hmm. there was a real wounding with men. And I, one reason I might think is just my dad was real passive. You know, my mom was very matriarchal and I always had a sense about him not really being a man. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. Show that in our home in the way I expected him to or wanted him to. I think now it's just not my calling. I think, you know, the Lord's calling me in a different direction, more mm -hmm. intimately with him. And it's, it's just a beautiful life that's opening, a spiritual life that's opening up, I think, as I grow in, in my healing and this healing process and just grow my relationship with him. Hildy, this might sound like an odd question, but it's something that I'm noticing. Just Bob, would you, you would recognize this when you sat face to face with people in clinical settings. I think it's like over 15,000 hours that I've done this now. Something I'm noticing about you is you don't embellish. And what, what I've noticed as you've talked the whole time, you're willing to say what's not the case, even if it puts you in a bad light. And if we, if anybody wanted to do this, go back and re-listen to the episode and just listen. Does Hildy ever embellish anything? Does she ever take something and make it louder when it's not actually louder or make it quieter when it's not actually quieter? And as I've been listening to you the whole time, you'll just simply say what it is. And I, I think what I'm hearing you there is you probably don't even notice that. That's what I'm, I'm guessing. You probably don't even notice no. that that's what you're doing. No, I'm just trying to speak what I know is true, I guess. Right which I think is really interesting and important to understand. And just something to notice, I'm noticing this about you. Like, here's a silly example, right? If somebody said, Oh, Hildy, how tall are you? And let's say you were five, seven, you wouldn't say five, seven and a half. You would just say I'm five, seven. I say five, seven and three fours. <laughs> and that's exactly <laughs> my point. And the reason I'm highlighting this, the people that go, Jake, where the heck are you talking about? Why are you going down this weird path? The reason I'm saying it is because I don't sense in you at all duplicity. I don't sense in you any desire or manipulative dynamic. Like I'm going to manipulate or twist something. My experience of you, and I could be dead wrong, but my experience of you is I'm simply going to take things as they are, and I'm simply going to understand them as they are, and I'm simply going to be honest wherever that is, whatever is the case. That is really refreshing, just in people in general. I don't know what I think it's just part of your identity and who God made you to be is that because you don't do that. I find you very trustworthy. Right? I, there, I sense no duplicity in you. And that what a beautiful Jesus talks about that. Nathaniel, yeah, with Nathaniel, there's no duplicity in him. To me, that's one of the highest honors you could say about a person. Their yes is yes and their no is no. And I'm hearing you say this the whole way along where you're not, you're saying, well, yeah, I was, I was attracted to women and here's how it happened. And then this happened and then it shifted to this. And it's not like you're not trying to prove anything. You're just, this is my story. This is what the case is. And if you disagree, then fine, but this is the truth of, so I, I'm highlighting that because I don't know if that's always the case. I think other people have other wounds and other dynamics that go on and that gets into their story and what they share. And so I, I just want to affirm you for that because, man, I wish that there was more of that in the world where our yes was yes and our no was no. Because when I ask somebody about their story, especially a sensitive topic like this, I really want to hear the truth. I just want to hear their real experience. And I don't know, I think it's just, it's beautiful because somehow you can filter things out that, or you just don't have it. And I just love it. I just love, there's no duplicity in you. So thank you for however, like, thank God, or however that might, I feel like that sounds weird. Does it make sense what I'm saying? That's very true. I've experienced that from the time I met Hildy. It's part of what's endearing about her yeah. is just that, that tenaciousness to truth. And yeah. And this is the way it is, you know, see what you see is what you get. Yeah. So Hildy, if I can transition a little bit, you know, first of all, talk a little bit about the theological formation, just fairly briefly about how important that was before you began the healing sure. of the deeper places of your heart. And so that's kind of maybe a good way, because that's how we started. And this is kind of how it's landing or going. But mm. after that conversion, Medjugorje had no idea really what to do. It's just depending on God to lead me. I kind of felt like Mary Magdalene and the chosen, you know, like 10 days before I went to Medjugorje, I was one way and 10 days later, I knew I was different. And so mm -hmm. 
huge, huge. I just felt very led by that truth, kind of like the scripture in Solomon. He asked for wisdom. I asked for truth. And so there was this burning desire to know God. I mean, it's just burning. I just wanted to know everything I could about him. So I, st- I went back to RCA for a couple of years. Class just, I, you know, God put me, just put, you know, a Dominican priest in my path. And, you know, he was teaching the catechism there. And it was just really, really beautiful. And then there was a young adults group at the parish. And we started doing these deep Bible studies mm-hmm. with Jeff Cavins and Scott Hahn. It was just at that right timing. So I went and studied there and studied theology, not for a degree. And God was just doing amazing things. There's just, and I see how my conversion is unfolding into the healing. So we go into the healing process that God was really form, forming my mind, mm. just soaking in all this stuff and just basking in it, really. The intellectual, you know, prayer, that's all I knew, you know, didn't know. I thought I was healed, you know, 10 days later, mm. I'm healed. I'm getting all this formation. I was on fire for the Lord. I was sharing what I knew mm. as God put people in my path and accordingly. And then it just hit this period, very dark period in my life. It was so abrupt. Just my world was gone. And, you know, just everything in my world, my friends, my career, everything just changed at a drop of a dime. And the God that I knew was not the God that was happening, you know, and, and it was really, again, retrospectively walking through this with Bob and he pointed out, but I didn't know what was going on at the time. It was just like, all my wounds were being exposed, things were being exposed. Mm. And there was a, it was just a very dark period of my time and, and that period of time. And I just went back to a lot of those behaviors, just went back because mm. that's what I knew. That's when that period started where this stuff was going on in my heart and I didn't know how to express it. And let, I, let me, let me just talk, stop for a second. When you say you went back to your behaviors, did you go back into the lesbian oh, lifestyle? Oh, thank you for clarifying. No, I didn't yeah. go completely back into it, but I would go uh, visit bars you know i would go back to the bars and Hmm. entered into a deeper like pornography Hmm. just a really dark three or four Hmm. years because i knew god one way and and i didn't understand i mean there's no warning to this it just happened (laughs) in the sense of like a couple week period of time and and i really tried to pray through it and not understanding what wounds were being triggered what what things were happening you know, there were decisions that were made. I mean, I tried to pray through it. I I had people praying for me, you know, the priests that I knew, but it just kept getting darker and darker for me. And so there was just a period where, where I I did not know inside of my heart what was going on. And that's when I reached this, I mean, I was losing my friends and, you know, a mentor I had in Steubenville and, and just, Mm. that was just taken out of my life, just circumstances and, and really felt abandoned, alone, isolated, in my sin again. And, 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 and it was just horrifying. It was horrifying to me that this God that I love, and I knew I love God and in truth. And I, and I was, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and that's when I prayed, God, please send me something, send me someone. And he answered both those prayers too. And I read Bob's book and then he's been walking through this with me. And it's just powerful powerful, powerful as these layers are coming off and to walk through stuff that happened years ago that I didn't even understand I needed to do, Mm. building a trust with him and then being able to do that and experience Christ through him and this working with him and, you know, conferences that I went to of his reading, you know, other resources, Leanne Payne, just discovering and then facing this, I would spend hours with Jesus. I still do. I love spending hours with Jesus. But I would take this before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And just having him work the sacraments was just so important. And now there's just dealing with this stuff that was inside of me. Hmm. I mean, I've got a long way to go. But just going to these places in my heart that were so wounded and damaged and, and experiencing freedom in a way that, you know, I never knew I needed or but I didn't realize that that period of time was to expose these wounds. So there's a, you know, my conversion went from, you know, the mind to God wanting to deal with the heart. And now I I believe that's the sense I have as I'm being more and more, you know, freed is this God wants to integrate that. There's still a lot of disintegration inside of me. Hmm. Just, I just entered a new season the last couple of months and deep, deep places in my heart. They're really frightening. You know, there's a couple of times I'm just like, Lord, I don't want you to love me this much. You know, he just shows so much of his love. It's just painful. I mean, it's painful. And and mm. I didn't know this existed, you know. And so as I'm walking through this and he uses people, he uses things that 
are dear to me, you know, to, to, as kind of the scapel, you know, I'm a nurse, I'm a surgical nurse. So mm. th this whole picture, there's no <laughs> anesthesia, right? I mean, mm -hmm. wow. you know, you can't sleep through it. You've got to walk through it. Wow. I'm so profoundly uh, hopeful, you know, of where he's leading in because now my desires are changing and I want to be a saint. So when you said, are you married? I kind of am, I'm, you know, I've got some. Yeah, yeah. So that's what my desires are. That's my goal. That's my hope. And uh, I know it's a road less traveled, you know, Jesus did mm. say, you know, the road to perdition is wide and to eternal life is narrow. And, you know, I just love him and he's the truth, the way and the life. And I want to follow that truth. I mean, these places deep in my heart, Jake, I don't even understand. I mean, is real mystery there, real sacred. I just, as I pray and I bring it before the Lord, it's a sacred, it's all sacred, but it's just mm -hmm. these deep places are really sacred. And I just, Jesus, I want to trust you. I want to go there with you. But I have to admit, I mean, I, I'm, I'm totally frightened, you know, these deep places. So I'm, you know, I just keep bring it to him every day and trusting that he's going to get me where I need to go. If I, if I could just kind of talk about it in terms of layers, you know, what, what I experienced is kind of the first layer was that feeling not understood, which was a kind of abandonment and then working down into the shame. Yeah. Right. And and working through the shame and how powerful that shame was. Bob, can you just link these to real events so that listeners can go like, yeah, if you're comfortable doing any of that, Hildy, I'll let you do that. But kind of highlighting the layers and in freedom, you can share whatever you want to share. And then the rejection, that deep sense of rejection that was there. And then a, this sense of deep fear and terror of abandonment of, of death, you know, it just just your healing process has kind of walked down through those places and hopelessness has also been one of the things. If you could just share anything about any of those places, just to give people tangible experience of the journey that you've been on. I think people sometimes think about the healing process as, you know, this is simple changing your mind, hmm. you know, uh, and just knowing the truth or of even, you know, kind of the criticism of conversion therapy is, you know, kind of being manipulated into converting your will. But the journey you've been on is is such a deep journey of the heart. And I, and I hmm. think it would be helpful if you can share some of what you've discovered in that, what you've experienced in that. Sure. Well, some of it can't be put into words, you know, because they're just deep hmm. things that can't be put into words. But I, I think the initial thing is, you can't really change your mind. You have to encounter truth. You have to counter in person. I, I, I don't think mm. I can go 10 days in, in a little town in Bosnia, you know, in Medjugorje and just come back this way. There's an encounter there. Mm. And so it started there, but just walking through in the healing process, just the layers you're talking about started with just walking back through, which is crazy because, you know, and maybe I'm aging myself, but I'm older, but it's like, not even walking through those relationships, like being able to walk through those with you was the first layer and just identifying those things. Like I was so ashamed and each layer comes with shame and God mm -hmm. removes that shame and, and you move to, yeah, it it's like a traveling into your heart. That was the initial thing. I remember walking through those relationships with you and, and the shame and that I, I never told anybody what I did with that first relationship you know, what I got into afterwards, you know, those last four years. And then when God pulled that away, you know, I started understanding myself better. He started showing me my sins. He started showing me just a, each layer came with a deeper sense of relationship with Jesus. Hmm. And it's, it came with choices, you know, Jesus is not going to invade um, my free will. So it's not an easy, I have to say it's very arduous and you just choose that. And I choose that because I love him and I trust him. You know, it's on my end, not on his, where I like, oh, I don't want to go to this next layer. I don't want to go to this next level. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to put into words as it goes deeper. But it's it's just a, a deep sense of a, a freedom that comes with each layer and the shame that comes away from that and a deeper sense of identity. This is probably the closest I've got a long way to go of just that identity of being a woman, you know, and mm -hmm. and what that means and openness. And, and I, I think a, a priest in confession recently put it best, you know, he told me to reflect on Mary. I thought it was beautiful because I'm still, and this is months ago, but he said, you know, think about Mary and your femininity. Mary was assertive, but she was docile, you know, and mm. Mary was open. And so it's just done wonders, you know, and to develop a deeper relationship with her 
it's hard to explain some of the things that go on inside as God's going deeper, but he just really pulling away these layers. And I just notice in my life, you know, he turns things around, you know, there's a song now that says God turned things around. It's a Christian song, but hmm. he redeems by turning things around like he did with Peter. And I noticed that, that he does that in my life and each layer, he's turning something around. That's the best way I know how to describe it. I think of the book, Redeeming Love, you know, the story of Hosea yeah, and just how he has been wooing you out into the desert and showing his love to you and, and the deep love that you have for him. I, you know, I just, as anybody, as much as anybody I know, I just see the depth of love that you have for him and the realization of the depth of love that he has for you and the way that he's been just wooing you giving you total freedom, but just wooing you into those deeper places. But it's, as you said, it's been a challenging path and you've had to make choices. And, you know, what I have witnessed is, is that he has not in any way, unlike those earthly lovers who violated your will, he has respected your will at every turn. And even some ways like your mother would violate your will, even in spiritual things, you know, and that's been really important that that respect that Jesus has had, that he just has been very patient and waited for your will to come along with him to go to those next places. And as that, you're becoming more and more docile. The combining of your strong will with that docility is a beautiful tenacity. Mm. You know, it's just a beautiful tenacity for the Lord rather than what it used to be as a willful rebellion to sin. Now it's a beautiful tenacity to speak and live the truth. Yeah, and I, I would say you articulate, as you always do very well, my experience. By the way, it's such a gift to me. I just want to say that because God knows, you know, as you articulate some of these things and what I'm going through, so affirming, and it's a beautiful gift. So I just appreciate that as well. Thank you. Hildy, I just want to say thank you for being with us. There's so much here, you know, I, I've just enjoyed listening to you and this is one of those episodes for me, if I'm putting myself in the position of the listener, where I would want to go back and listen to it and just sit with it because I wrote down all these notes and I'm just going, gosh, there's a lot here. I mean, not ironically, or I guess, of course, this is what, there was so much truth that came out. But what's interesting is as I was listening to you, it was subtle. It wasn't like this blatant billboard statement of truth that's obvious and has flashing neon signs around it, like conscience and emotion, conscience being misunderstood as emotion. I felt like today was riddled with those things all the way through it. I just want to thank you because I know you sharing your story like you have here is new for you. And so I just want to thank you for the courage that you've shown and that you have to help bring truth and for people to encounter the truth. And I, I just, my part, I'll end with this, and Bob, I'll let you uh, wrap us up, is you keep saying truth is a person. And that's the teaching of the church for millennia. And I, I love the appropriate spin or turning back, like you said, turn around, turning it back to, it's not an idea. This is Pope Benedict, like Christianity is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea. It's an encounter with a person. And you keep saying that, and I just go, right, your journey is this ongoing encounter with a loving God who's also pretty committed. Well, that's an understatement. He's highly committed, right? <laughs> but he's, he's highly committed to, to you, and you've grown in commitment to him. And it's just, wow, a simple, beautiful journey of walking with the Lord and what occurs there. So thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your willingness to share. I, it's just been a pleasure to chat with you. Bob, any final thoughts? Yeah, just a, a gratitude, Hildy. I, I, I know what it's taken for you to get to this point. And uh, mm. I just admire that holy tenacity mm. that you've lived every part of it and, and the desire for truth and, and to live in that relationship with Jesus. And I get to know him more through you. Uh, in our friendship. Just to clear it, everybody, I'm not your therapist. I've never been your therapist. I don't practice as a therapist. We've just been friends along this journey. Mm -hmm. I, I guess two things before we, for you to have uh, two last words. One is, this is the first time you're telling your story publicly. Who are you most concerned about hearing this? Um. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, That's it's kind of easy because I, I don't have to face an audience, right? You know, like this is just yeah, us. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I realize yeah, it's yeah. going out there. I don't know. I was thinking about my family. I don't uh, like not that, hmm. but yeah. but uh, family or maybe some people I know. You know, maybe some close friends hmm. because it, you know some of the stuff I haven't even shared with some of them. <laughs> so, hmm. but it's okay. You know, I I, I really sense that and. God led me to this point and I'm um, very grateful you had me on and I pray that it really be helpful, you know? Yeah. The other side of that question is, who do you most want to hear this? Who do you desire to hear this most? That's easy because like I understand the struggle. I really, really do with same sex attraction and just to see what God's done in my life to kind of turn that around. And he's really healing those attractions. He's drawing me in in deeper level my identity as a woman and i just desire that for them i desire those who struggle with this to know the truth you know to be led in that direction of truth and i have to say you know one thing that's been on my heart as you both were speaking is just that i don't understand there's times you know my attractions are one way and i know the church teaches another way and i things are mm. triggered and all this stuff but it's just to encourage people to know that God is faithful and he knows what's best for us, even if we don't, as sometimes we feel a certain way, but if we just remain faithful to his truth, he's gonna break through and on his timing and his way, and there's gonna be freedom, there's gonna be joy, and uh, it's just a lifelong process. So that's mm. the hope that I carry on and I hope to give that to others. Mm. Hildy, Amen. that's awesome, amen. Listeners, I, I just wanna ask that you would pray for Hildy. So just you know, as you are finishing up the episode, just say a very simple prayer, just pray the name of Jesus over her or hail Mary or something over her, because it takes a lot of courage to step out and, and start sharing deep parts of your heart. And Hildy, I, I've been blessed and I'm sure many, many, many other people will be blessed. So thanks again for joining us and really grateful for you, your yes, all your yeses along the way that have led here. So it's awesome. And listeners, we're praying for you and we look forward to talking to you again soon.